I want to begin um, the introduction with a poem by W.S. Merlin, who passed away in March this year. And the poem is called Rain Light. All day the stars watch for long ago. My mother said, I am going now. When you are alone, you will be all right. Whether or not you know, you will know. Look at the old house in the dawn rain. All the flowers are forms of water. The sun reminds them through a white cloud, touches the patchwork spread on the hill. The washed colors of the afterlife that lived there long, long before you were born. See how they wake without a question, even though the whole world is burning. When asked about that poem on NPR's Fresh Air, Merwin replied, what happens as you face the fact that the entire world is slipping, dissolving around you, around us? We have that feeling about our civilization, about our species, and everything else, that it's all in danger, and indeed it is. And we either face that as a recognition, that that's our moment, or we sort of groan and dread it, which is a waste of time. Today's performance is going to engage us and stir within our, ourselves the question, what if? What if this is the moment? What will you do and how will you make it yours? The library has provided a recommended reading list for you to further explore some of the subjects addressed today. We also want your feedback, so please fill out the surveys at your seats. Library Journal's 2019 Librarian of the Year, Sky Patrick, of the LA County Library System, said this about public libraries. There is a strong, important future for libraries. Libraries are not about books. They are about people. We have to change how we serve and engage people. The library of the 21st century must build a high level of engagement with the community and be a constant learning environment, both formally and informally. SBPL has embraced this tenant for some time now. And just one example is our five-year Beloved relationship with Drama Dogs, the library's resident theater company. Over the past five years, Drama Dogs and SBPL have partnered to present many theatrical performances, including original theater pieces that align with the book club's themes and creative interpretations of books from the Santa Barbara Reads program. The library is dedicated to educating, captivating, and connecting the community through the arts, technology, and performance. Drama Dogs, through their partnership with the library, is dedicated to providing quality and thought-provoking theater free to our community. For those of you who know U2's 1983 song, Two Hearts Beat as One, well, Bonnie and Ken are the heart of Drama Dogs. And in collaboration, their hearts beat as one. Without further ado, I present to you Drama Dogs. I am Ken Gilbert. And I'm E. Bonnie Lewis. We are the co-artistic directors of Drama Dogs, a theater company. Since 2015, Drama Dogs, a theater company, created its relevant action program that fosters communication and education among the members of our local community which addresses current social issues through the medium of theater. We've aligned our productions with various community building organizations, such as NEA, the Reed Program, and the Santa Barbara Public Library. 
which promotes insight into relevant social issues through the power of a good book, and climate change theater action, which highlights concepts of environmental awareness. Our intent is to create stimulating art that evokes and provokes enthusiastic responses from our audiences. Through our relevant action program, we continue to cultivate our artistic activist voices. This is the third time we have aligned with climate change theater action and bringing forward issues of climate change. Lighting the way is the theme of Climate Change Theater Action 2019. Climate Change Theater Action is an international collaborative of theater artists around the world performing 50 short plays that address our concerns about our changing ecosystem. Drama, Dog, Drama Dogs chose to weave six plays into a singular event. We have developed an ensemble of five actors and a musician to explore a myriad of climate issues that we face every day. As the actors move from play to play, story to story, we will guide your journey of connection, mythology, relationship, sustainability, sorrow from loss, adaptation, and possibility. As we begin our journey, we will meet the ensemble of actors as they gather in a prologue to the plays. Then, the first play will begin. A letter from the ocean. What if we gather and listen to each other for a while? What if we tell each other our stories? Then, what if the ocean writes a letter to the human race telling her story about what she would like human beings to consider as they live in the present and tend to the future. occurred about how one should live an honest life. 
Often there were encounters, but then, then the encounters were perhaps less plain because most of the people coming through these woods were running away from the worst conditions imaginable. And they heard that the poets and the people that lived in this time would provide food, shelter, and safe passage. And they were right. The poet and their people did provide these things in exchange for nothing. In exchange for nothing. Except maybe a little song or a story maybe a new recipe. If you walk into this hut, you won't see it now, but over there, there used to be a shelf where all the little stories and songs and recipes were kept in small makeshift books written by hand. And if you were to run your hands along that shelf, you could hear all their voices. So we talked to each other for a while. So we listened to our stories. In exchange for nothing. In exchange for nothing. In exchange for nothing. Be here. In exchange for nothing. Be here. Just be here. Just be here. Just each other. Each other. Each other. In exchange for nothing. Except to be here. Just, Just be here with each other. I've been thinking about what life would be like now after I lived in the hut. I was thinking about how it was that we could recall the songs of those who had passed, but couldn't seem to make our own songs last. A letter came from the ocean. It was addressed to the person that went away to the hut in the woods. The letter was enclosed in a small envelope that smelled of lilac. I opened the seal carefully. It's not every day, after all, that the ocean writes you a letter. The paper was gossamer thin. The letter began. Dear person who went away to the hut in the woods while the world was on fire, I don't suppose you know what you sound like, but from where I live, it sounds as if every word is dandelion. I hadn't heard that word in a long time. Just like I hadn't heard the words nectar, willow, since you were seven years of age. I miss those words. I like them better than warm, cut and paste. <laughs> but then again, you know that. Because you were here, in the woods, in the hut, where a poet once lived, and others too. And soon you will go back to your home in the city and try to live your life again. And perhaps let go of some of your rage. And perhaps start to look at others with kindness. It isn't easy, I know. I am used to my rage, too. It can be useful. Part of us, after all. Sometimes I rage so much my ways destroy everything, and I think they will learn that. These humans will learn because they have brains, and they have logic and reason, and they have this thing too called imagination. And with it, they can do so much, so much good. Sometimes when I hear their songs, I can't help but get emotional. I'm a softie that way. I hope you can forgive me. I know being soft isn't in fashion these days, but sometimes I just can't help myself. Because sometimes on certain days when the light hits the sky a certain way, or when I see someone walking along the beach, their eyes full of possibility. Or a child rescued in a peacekeeper's arms. While bombs carry their city away, I think I'm in love. I really am. I love you.
love you all so much. We journey away from the ocean and look to the stars for the magic they hold. Blood on the leaves. What if we remember that there are myths and stories, some are celestial and some are earthly, that remind us of the sacrifices we must make so that the earth can do what it must. Sharing these stories helps us remember our relationship to the stars and how to maintain the balance in the world. <laughs> Why? 
uh, our entire world operates this way, he's supposed to be our reminder that we're supposed to make sacrifices for each other. And every time that's for you, you know, we take one step closer to You're paranoid. You're holding a brown leaf in autumn, and I, and I don't see him. Well, star beings can't just leave the sky. Can they? I, I don't know. This has never happened before. Well, like, maybe it's a good thing. Like, maybe the bear wanted to stay alive. Go, bear, go! <laughs> and who died instead? There are sacrifices we must make for the world to go on as it should. What would you do if you were the hunter? Stops for you. Okay, so say this year the hunter doesn't want to kill the bear. And the bear says, Please do not betray us. <laughs> and the leaves stop turning. And the hunter drops down and buys a suit, builds a skyscraper, and, and he leaves. They stop right And he comes to this world and, and, and he gets a television and a microwave. And the bear says, please, remember me, for I am waiting. And the leaves, they are waiting too, for they know their part in the relationship. They all know what they're supposed to do. But the hunter stopped doing what must be done. And the hunter stops. The bear stops. The leaves stop. And the great spirit? So the crystal 
like the heart and the pen this morning? English, please. You can name the last one. No, thanks. Something gender neutral. Why? Because we won't be able to tell if they're boys or girls until they emerge. Red. I'm kind of attracted to pencil pill bottles. You're telling me that you can see a male butterfly's dick? Scott. <laughs> the males have two black dots on their wings. Rowan. What? Uh, butterfly? Oh! <laughs> Good choice. Your grandpa and I planted that rowan tree over there when we got back from our honeymoon. Do you know the symbolism of that tree? I didn't even know rowan was a tree. Just attach the crystal eyes and I'll turn the internet back on. When I was a girl, there would be a time of year when we'd walk home from school and all the trees and bushes would be covered with monarch butterflies. Really? It's an amazing sight. I just want to help them get their numbers back up. After all, they do help to pollinate, and those poor honeybees need all the help they can get. That was that. What now? They'll come, they'll come out of their chrysalides in about 11 or 12 days. Dry their wings and fly away. Huh. Cool. You'll be happy to know that your job is then done. It wasn't all bad. <laughs> a promise is a promise. I thought you were a great teacher, Grandma. Well, I tried. <coughs> so, what is it? Isn't the internet working? Yeah, I was just curious about the uh, rowing tree. Can't you find out about it on your phone? I'd rather you tell me. <laughs> oh, Scott, really? Come on, Grandma, it's a little tree that's been like I know, I know, I'm hard to be mellow. <laughs> I'll be right back. rowan trees next to their homes. It's known as the tree of life. <coughs> Try to keep the tents underneath them, honey. Like this? Yeah, perfect. We move from an intimate family relationship to a newfound connection that moves us out of our phones. Miss Viola Evie Anderson's dining hall for me. What if we reflect on the possibility of hidden metaphysical benefits that can be provided by the seemingly apparent actions of the plant and animal kingdom? Let's lift our heads out of our cell phones and let's sense the vibrational frequencies in all that we encounter and see
that matter? The bees. The buzzing. <laughs> a bee's wings flap around 200 times a second. Imagine if there were a hundred bees, a thousand bees, a million bees. Now that's a whole lot of buzzing and buzzing vibration. And everything in the universe vibrates, including us. Except most people these days vibrate at dangerously low frequencies. And people do crazy, careless things when they're walking through this world have to sleep. A bee's buzzing raises its frequencies. It wakes people up. I've never heard of it. Do you have any scientific evidence to subsist? What is science? Except an intellect intended to rationalize the God. If God can make dinosaurs and rainbows and unicorns, yes, I believe in unicorns. <laughs> I don't see any reason why God didn't make the buzzing of the bees to raise the vibrational frequency of humankind. People save the bees because they pollinate, because they're crucial to a healthy ecosystem. And that That's a given. But what good is a healthy ecosystem if the world is overrun by hairless, sleepwalking, zombies, constantly trying to dig away to fuck this planet up? disaster, a tsunami, earthquake, fire, or flood? What if we fracture an innocent fairy tale and fill in the gaps with the horrors of surviving a disaster of epic proportions? How do we survive and endure? There is a woman who is a mother. She pledges her allegiance like to be of you under the power of the Almighty, the government, that is. She is blessed and promised a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In return, she promises to work hard, work tough, work strong to earn her keep. Boy, does she work. Work so hard, the calluses on her hands prevent her from feeling the face of the child. She hates her hands. Hands on to make her new home grow. Grow big and strong and tall so you can look after me one day. She says to her littlest little one. And he looks up at her and blinks as if to say, yes. Each day when I thought, she kneels by her bed and counts her blessings. Day in, day out, she bows her head in sweat for religion. On Tuesday, without warning.
closed, her eyes open, she can barely stand. What just happened? Where is her almighty? The government that is. She remem remembers walking her son to school, her son. She reaches for it, where once his little hand held hers, she grabs, she grasps, she clutches. She hopes nothing. He left without saying goodbye. She ages 70 years in this moment. She blacks out. As if waking up for the very first time in an Eden of hell. All she can see are nameless faces buried in the levee walls. And God. Out. The sunlight sparkles like an array of diamonds against the twisted metal of his broken glass. Her throat is dry with the brackish twang. Her voice is hoarse as it echoes off the splintered trees. She weeps. Hands crimson with the digging. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? The vultures of fate circle around her as they mock her cawing. From the fields to the source, she searches for life. Her legs bloat from the lack of warmth. around the shoe. She takes in the dirty white canvas with black laces. She recognizes a small hole that reveals where his little toe would poke through. Mm -hmm. In 
until now it is he. Where he is, he has no need for shoes. Fills it again to the point to tears. She sways to the melody of his voice in the hall of the names of the playground. She looks down at the shoe. She lives her life now in this shoe. waits for a savior to swoop down and save her. Her savior, the almighty, the government, that is. The old woman who lives in the shoe. We are traumatized from a moment of devastation, and we find ways to comfort and soothe us. Let's shift our awareness to an expanded possibility. The Earth's blue heart. What if we engage in conversation and dialogues that cause our perception to <coughs> shift about Earth and her inhabitants? What if we consider the possibility of being in relationship with someone or something, and not in relationship to someone or something. We can't own another's heart, but we can be in relationship with it. I'm so happy. 
God. What we have won, the right we have won, is to not say, those are all fish. We never have to say that again. But the right to fish. I am saying that we reserve the right to the fish. We reserve the right to pray for the fish. We reserve the right to dance for the fish, to sing for the fish, to catch and eat the fish, to live with the fish, to be in relationship with the fish. That's what we're reserving. I feel free. Isn't that a belief? I feel like I'm being held. Doesn't that feel better? It does take the weight off. Being <laughs> held. That's hopeful. <laughs> Did you know the Antarctic black fin ice fish have blood that is clear? It's as if they have evolved to have useful anemia. <laughs> <laughs> we can be in relationship with the Antarctic black fin ice fish. And a heart three times bigger than it should be. Four. Four times bigger. A heart 60 times bigger than it should be. The heart of the Antarctic black and ice fish is on the outside of its body. <laughs> it's like a heart with a fish swimming inside of it. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> Something you do. Is that true? The stock like loose jaw dragonfish have red lights under their eyes that other fish can't see. So it can see them, but they can't see it. We can be in relationship with the stock like loose jaw dragonfish. <laughs> it's so possible, isn't it? So possible to adapt. The octopus has a brain contained in its entire body. <laughs> we can be in relationship with the octopus, <laughs> with the elephant, <laughs> with the elephant, <laughs> with the elephant, with the ocean.